Uh, this being Yom Kippur, it would seem like the appropriate time, perhaps the most appropriate time, for me to offer an apology. Before my remarks on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, I made a joke about the synagogue no longer serving Ben and Jerry's ice cream. This was an attempt on my part to say something lighthearted before offering a sermon of a serious nature. What I did not take into account was the possibility that there are those in our congregation who would find offensive my joking about Ben and Jerry's decision to no longer allow its ice cream to be sold in Judea and Samaria. This is a region often referred to as the West Bank or the occupied territories. Offensive because it could have appeared that I was making light of the situation of Palestinians living in the West Bank, and that was certainly not my intent. I do not wish for Palestinians to be treated with anything less than dignity and respect. In hindsight, I realize that with a situation as challenging and as provocative as the conditions under which Palestinians live in the territories, I ought not have said something humorous that suggested my annoyance with Ben and Jerry's decision. If I have something to say about the ice, ice cream maker's announcement, better that I should comment in a straightforward manner and leave room for discussion with those who feel differently. I have said before and I will say again that I take issue with the various attempts to boycott Israel, to encourage divestment from companies that do business with Israel, or to sanction Israel. While I know people who love Israel, who feel that it is okay to engage in forms of BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanction, in order to influence Israeli policies vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, I unequivocally do not. Would that Israeli and Palestinian leaders could work together to formulate an agreement, a deal that would allow for Israeli troops to no longer maintain checkpoints in the territories, nor contribute in any way to the hardships that many Palestinians endure. A deal that would give Palestinians the ability to govern all aspects of Palestinian life in the West Bank and additional territory in exchange for the Jewish cities and towns that exist in those areas. A deal that would also guarantee the safety of Israelis who should not have to live in fear of attacks from yet another neighboring country. I simply don't believe that the tactics employed by BDS proponents will bring this about. There are so many facets to the current predicament, so much history that has resulted in the present situation, so many considerations that would have to be part of any agreement that I, with my limited expertise and even more limited time constraints this morning, cannot do justice to a discussion of what needs to happen next in order to end the current stalemate. I am concerned that those who feel that the ball is entirely in Israel's court and that it is only because of Israel's intransigence that an agreement has not been reached until now would advocate that if enough economic pressure is brought to bear on Israel, the situation would be resolved. And in so doing, people who care about Israel and her future are now in part aligned with people who do not wish for Israel to have a future. It is well documented that there are people within the BDS movement who would argue that there ought not be a Jewish state. And it is for that reason, among many others, that I am upset by the decisions like Ben and Jerry's. I would never claim that Israel is without its defects, but I certainly don't want Israel, the Jewish state, to disappear. My love for Israel is strong, and I will support her right to exist and her right to defend her people to ensure their safety. I will well remember my introduction to Israel, not through movies or textbooks, but the first time that I visited Israel. It was the summer of 1980. My father had just led a two-week trip through the country, after which my parents, my two siblings, and I spent another four weeks living in Jerusalem. What can I say? That visit was transformative. What we saw and what we did over those six weeks was as exciting as anything I've ever experienced in my life. I've been back to Israel nearly a dozen times, twice for a year of study, but nothing has surpassed the first impressions that the country and its people made upon me that summer before my 14th birthday. I grew up in a home and attended a day school that developed my love for being Jewish and my pride in the Jewish state. Visiting its historic and sacred sites Masada, Caesarea, the Kinneret, Bethlehem, Jericho, Tel Aviv, and Jerusalem 
were more impressive than I could ever have possibly imagined. And living there for a month allowed me to feel, even at a young age, that this was more than simply a tourist destination. It really was another home. For many visitors, I know Israel is like a Disney World, a beautiful place with things to see and do, but more mythical than real. Climb Masada, float in the Dead Sea, snorkel in a lot, ride a camel, and pray at the Kotel. All of these are memorable experiences, but certainly not the full picture of what Israel is today. The truth is that Israel has both elements of what we want it to be, what we hope it will be, and then there is the reality of what it is. It's a modern country where today on Yom Kippur, the busiest highway in Israel is closed, full of people riding bicycles because almost no one drives on Yom Kippur. And Israel is the place where cell phones and instant messaging were invented, where drip irrigation was invented, allowing millions of people to grow crops with minimal water. And Israel is the place where, as a colleague likes to share, an older person might yell at you and shove you out of the way because you're taking too long to get on the bus, and then turn around and have a conversation with you and end up inviting you to Shabbat dinner because, well, you're family. Israel is a remarkable place. We should have no false illusions, however. Israel is also a country that has corruption, crime, poverty, and racism like any other country. And as we have seen over the last several years, Israel is a country so divided politically that it required four elections in order to elect a prime minister and form a government. The prayer for Israel that Cantor Sarah Lee chanted earlier in the service and that is recited in Jewish communities around the world begins with the words, Avinu Shabbat Shamayim, Barecha Medinat Yisrael, Reshit Smichat Gulatenu. Our Father in heaven, bless the state of Israel, the first sprouting of our redemption. The first sprouting of our redemption. That is an interesting phrase, is it not? I love the explanation of those words provided by Rabbi Shalom Cantor, who says that the prayer acknowledges that Israel is not yet perfected. It is just sprouting. It is just poking its head through the dirt, searching for the sunlight. And that is, can be a dirty process. Redemption, like a growing plant, is a process that requires constant watering and patience. It takes work and dedication, but in the end, it can produce the most amazing results because geula, redemption, is a process that spreads light and blessings throughout the world. In other words, we look to Israel as the beginning of redemption of the Jewish people throughout the world. Israel enables us to live proud as Jews, to be proud of who we are. In the words of the rabbi, Lord Jonathan Sachs of blessed memory, Judaism in Israel is a presence you breathe, not just a religion you practice. In Israel, as nowhere else, Jewishness is part of the public domain in the language, the landscape, and the calendar. Chaim Nachman Bialik, the famed Hebrew poet, stated during the 1920s that the Jews would know that their dream of a nation state had been fulfilled when there were Jewish prostitutes, Jewish thieves, and a Jewish police force to chase them, all conducting their business in Hebrew. Israel is probably the only country in the world where security cameras have filmed thieves kissing the mezuzah on the doorposts of the homes they were robbing <laughs> as they exited with the loot. And a news story reported that when police raided a home during a drug bust in Tel Aviv, they waited to make the arrest until after the mohel had completed the bris of the suspect's son. The commanding officer said afterwards, I'm happy that both the raid and the bris went well. <laughs> Chaim Nachman Bialik was acknowledging something that we all sometimes have trouble remembering. Israel is an incredible place that can recharge our Jewish souls connect us to our roots and inspire us. But it is also a real place, and it is imperfect, a place where modern and ancient cultures clash at times, creating a place like nowhere else in the world. The truth is that imagination clashes with the reality all the time. That is life. In our lives, we imagine the future. We make wonderful plans. We dream big dreams. But imagination then meets reality, and the dreams change. 
Singer-songwriter Aviv Geffen wrote a song, a lament at the end of a love affair, that might be seen to surmise, sorry, to summarize the relationship between Jews and Israel. There's been a collision between imagination and reality, and there have been casualties. What do we imagine Israel to be? What are the myths that we hold on to that we simply will not let go of? What is the reality? And what are the casualties of having such a gap between imagination and reality? While we love Israel and have much to be proud of, there is also no shortage of frustrations. The fact is that not just we feel alienated or sometimes distanced or even upset with Israeli policies. Israelis themselves have also been known to feel alienated from the Jewish state. Life in Israel, writes Rabbi Daniel Gordis, is going to continue to exact a high price from Israelis in no small measure because the conflicts with Israel's enemies appear to be unsolvable for the present. For a long time, Israelis understood that they had no choice but to pay that price, but that is true no longer. Increasingly, Israelis are asking both for themselves and for their sons and daughters, whom they will one day drive to the induction base to be drafted by the army, why pay this price if I can't say what it is that I am being asked to defend. Famed Israeli writer Amos Oz has shared his own complicated feelings towards Israel. I love Israel even when I cannot stand it. Should I be fated to collapse in the street one day, I want to collapse on a street in Israel. Not in London, not in Berlin, not in Paris or New York. In Israel, strangers will come and pick me up. And when I'm back on my feet, there will certainly be quite a few who would be pleased to see me fall again. I'm afraid of the government's policy, and I'm ashamed too, but I'm glad to be an Israeli. I'm glad to be a citizen of a country that has 8.5 million prime ministers, 8.5 million prophets, 8.5 million messiahs. It isn't boring here. What I've seen here in my life is far less and far more than what my parents or their parents could have dreamed of. Several years ago on a Federation mission to Israel, I was in the audience during a presentation by Avraham Infeld. Infeld is a Jewish educator and a Jewish leader who served as the Director General of the Shalom Hartman Institute and played a central role in the founding of Taglit Birthright Israel as its first director. He also happens to hold an honorary doctorate from Muhlenberg College. Infeld told us, our right to a Jewish state in Israel is justified by our being the Jewish people. But when Israel or Israelis ignore the Jewish people or forget their Jewish connection, they are actually undermining our very right to have a sovereign state. Unfortunately, the reality is that many Israeli Jews simply don't understand why we, as Jews in the diaspora, have such a connection to Israel and at the same time, American Jews don't understand why Israeli Jews can be so disconnected from the Judaism that we understand. In one of his lectures, Infeld gave the following example. Imagine the following scene, which I've been present for, he said. A group of American teens on a summer trip to Israel are going to be spending a few weeks on their summer interacting with teens from Israel. At the end of their first meal together, the leader of the American delegation, a rabbi of course, gets up and says to the group, okay, it is time for Birkat Hamazon, or it's time to bench. The Americans proceed to begin Baruch Atah Adonai, and the Israelis look at them as if they are some bizarre cult. You can imagine the conversation afterwards going something like this. An American says, what do you mean you don't know the Birkat Hamazon? How can you call yourself a Jew? And an Israeli answers, and how can you call yourself a Jew? Do you even understand what it is that you're saying? To which the American responds, hey, I go to Jewish summer camps, and we do Shabbat, and we know Israeli dances. I studied my butt off for my bar mitzvah, and I'm already planning to join Hillel and attend APAC conferences when I go to college to make sure to always stand up for Israel and Judaism. At which point the Israeli says, oh yeah? Well, while you're at your nice little college, 
I'm going to be busting my rear off in the Israeli Defense Forces, risking my life every day. So now you tell me who is more Jewish. We each have a lot to learn from each other, do we not? And a reason to respect the choices that the other makes. Some would argue that for Israel to be truly part of your Jewish identity, that you would have to live there. But the reality is that Israel needs Jews in the diaspora. Israel needs us to be able to stand up and to defend her when others attack her through veiled forms or overt forms of anti-Semitism. And Israel needs us to celebrate her and to speak proudly about her many amazing achievements. And Israel also needs us to be there to share to, so that we can remind Israel of the dream and what it is that Israel can stand for and achieve. And yes, Israel must understand that there will be times when we are perplexed by the decisions that her leaders make, especially when it feels that they have lost sight of how Israel is supposed to be a home and a refuge and a spiritual center for Jews throughout the world. My friends, on this sacred day of Yom Kippur, as we seek to reestablish our balance, both as individuals and as a community, I ask us to commit to supporting Israel, not blindly, without regard for our own ethical and moral sensibilities, but from a place of true love and compassion and partnership. How do we do this then when we are here in the diaspora and have such radically different opinions about Israel? We must be willing to engage in real conversations that go beyond the Disney World version of Israel. Today on this Yom Kippur, I ask you to invest the time and the energy to learn, to listen, and to speak about Israel, allowing yourselves to further understand its complex truths. We need to allow criticism and challenges of Israel to be voiced so that we can have a full and an honest conversation. And we need to understand Israel and its history thoroughly enough so that we can defend her and overcome the mischaracterizations and the misunderstandings and the mistruths that are so often trumpeted by those who do not see a need for a Jewish state. I also would advocate that you send your children and your grandchildren to Israel. I'm going to say something that may not be so popular, but is real. Birthright is a wonderful experience, a free trip that most of our children and grandchildren will go on for their Israel experience. But the reality is that birthright is not so much about Israel as it is about Jewish identity. If we are serious about building relationships with Israel, an important piece in our Jewish identities, then it is important that we invest in children and grandchildren going for longer, for a summer, a semester, or even a year to be spent in Israel. As one young person reflected after a summer of living and working at the Weizmann Institute, through the friendships I formed with Israelis, I was able to understand the daily experience of Israelis, what worries them, what annoys them, and what excites them. There are dozens of amazing programs for people in high school and college and post-college, internships, and we have the resources to help them achieve this possibility to have these real experiences. On Israel's 70th anniversary, the president of Israel, Ruven Rivlin, assembled 12,000 singers from all streams of Israeli society to sing Naomi Shemer's Al Kol Eila. This beautiful composition contains the following lines. Over all these things, over all these things, please stand guard for me, my good God. Over the honey and the stinger, over the bitter and the sweet, don't uproot a sapling don't forget the hope, may you return to me, and may I return to the good land. Though we may love Israel, that isn't to say that we won't feel the sting when we find ourselves at odds with Israel's decisions. But if we invest in nurturing our relationships with her, we will be able to find that the sprouting of the flower of our redemption provides us with the sweetest of honey in the year to come. Amen. Amen.